The proxy problem is huge in two ways. First, on the micro level, selecting a proxy and talking about end of life seems to be one of those things that most never get around to doing. On the macro level, the lack of proxies creates a heavy burden on providers. In nearly 80% of the 2.5 million deaths occurring in U.S. hospitals each year, surrogates make 70 to 90% of intensive care unit decisions to withhold or withdraw life sustaining treatment. Therefore, surrogate decisions likely influence nearly 1.5 million deaths per year. About 85% of us die after a chronic illness like dementia, and up to half of us are not in a position to make our own decisions when we're close to death. It is also unlikely that even after a drawn out illness, our family will not know our views on how we want to die, unless we've talked about it. Before 1990, most of the seriously ill or frail were defended and protected by primary care p h y s i c i a n But then a law made this illegal. The Patient Self Determination Act was passed. As a result, Dr. Elizabeth Chayton writes the decision making power previously relegated to the physician was now to be shared with the ill patient and those chosen as surrogate decision makers. The law makes us give up our family doctor as a proxy and requires us to choose someone to speak for us when we can no longer speak for ourselves. Most don't know the law and most don't choose. Most even ignore the invitation to do this when admitted to a hospital. Here's where we are today. Number one, modern medicine has created a type of life that has never been seen before. The very sick and old used to just die. Number two, The Patient Self Determination Act gives every person the right to facilitate his or her own health care, to refuse or accept treatments, and to create an advance directive. Number three, in 2015, this law will be 25 years old, and most Americans have not taken advantage of the rights it offers us. Number four, the law added a layer of legal pressure, forcing doctors to play it safe to avoid litigation. Michelle Mello and her co authors wrote that the cost of defensive medicine in 2008 was $55.6 billion. Number five, in emergencies, physicians don't have time to ask if a person has an advance directive. Number six, physicians may not follow the written wishes of a patient. One study revealed that physicians can consider appropriate care to be inconsistent with the desires expressed in an advance directive. Number seven, physicians can't make an end of life decision for a patient. Number eight, most proxies are not chosen by the patient. They are the defaults. State laws vary, but in general, proxies are family members. Most often, these family members have not received any instructions from the patient. And unfortunately for the patient, as Dr. Michael Mitchell said in the class lecture, when someone is dying, There is no such thing as a functional family. Number nine, Dr. Jean Kuttner, the current president of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, told me in an interview that the living will is not very useful. What matters most is the proxy you choose. And research shows there is evidence that an advance directive does not affect physician management. And finally, number ten. Third party payers seem to be able to tap into an endless flow of cash to fund experimental and futile care on a fee for service basis. The proxy problem is costing us billions every year. So, what can we do with this problem? For the purposes of this very short paper and presentation, I have three solutions to propose. Solution number one repeal the bad law. Once we thought bloodletting was a good idea. There's a reason we don't do it anymore. It didn't work. Repealing the law sounds good to me, and, in, and it is great in theory, but forget about it. Physician and director of Aetna's medical strategy, Dr. Randy Krakauer, said even the big insurance companies will not attempt to go up against the trial lawyers who have the richest lobby in D.C. Repealing laws. Takes money out of the pockets of trial lawyers because law, especially hazy law, is the mother's milk of legal fees. Solution number two 
require a proxy at the time of Medicare or Medicaid enrollment. The enrollee either writes in the name of the proxy they choose or the name of their primary care physician. The new rules state that Medicare and Medicaid have the right to name the hospital palliative care team if no name is provided. This could work very well. Here's why. The government owns end-of-life care. It's not hard to require a bit of information from a person who is very motivated to get free hospital care. All adult, ch adult children can't be named. Only one name allowed. If the enrollee doesn't give a name, they will be given the choice between their own physician or a palliative care team. This might sound very good to many, and with a little luck, this rule could move thousands toward better end-of-life care. It means no one needs to burden their children, and decisions are sorted out by the professionals. And yes, solution number three, ration care. The president drove the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which took $716 billion away from Medicare. To accomplish this, he was surrounded by experts who all spoke publicly for the concept of rationing care. In 1994, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel wrote in his article, The Economics of Dying, that the Patient Self-Determination Act was increasing the cost of care because proxies demanded more care than physicians recommended. He said about 20% of patients want life-sustaining therapy even if they are in a persistent vegetative state. Robert Reich is Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley and was Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. He said, If you're very old, we're not going to give you all that technology and all those drugs for the last couple of years of your life to keep you going for maybe another couple of months. It's too expensive. So, we're going to let you die. Dr. Howard Dean, the former head of the Democrat National Committee and physician, said the Independent Payment Advisory Board is essentially a health care rationing body. By setting doctor reimbursement rates for Medicare and determining which procedures and drugs will be covered and at what price, the IPAB will be able to stop certain treatments its, its members do not favor by simply setting rates to levels where no doctor or hospital will perform them. He added, there does have to be control of costs in the health care system. Mr. Ratner served as counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury in the Obama administration. He writes in the New York Times, We need death panels, and said that saving big money in Medicare would come from reducing the cost of treating people in the last year of life, which consumes more than a quarter of the program's budget. Jonathan Gruber has famously said the truth about the Affordable Care Act. With some of us, while some of us have tried to read it and find it nearly impossible to comprehend, finally we learn from a key architect that the law was intentionally written to confuse. He said, This bill was written in a tortured way to make sure the Congressional Budget Office did not score the mandate as taxes. Lack of transparency is a huge political advantage, and basically, Call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever, but basically that was really, really critical to getting the thing to pass. Now we understand that the confusion was intentional. Yes, the law does ration, it just never says this clearly. And here's Dr. Manuel again, 20 years later on the same topic. He wrote just a few weeks ago in The Atlantic that he plans a do it yourself style of rationing. He is suggesting that we all just die before medicine, Medicare, starts to ration our care. This has always been my plan, but it is only for those of us who are willing to think and plan for a peaceful death. And we know that most don't have a strategy, which is the root of the proxy problem. Most just flow into the system, so for those who ignore Dr. Emanuel's suggestion to die at or around the age of 75, it could be telemedicine to the rescue. For those on life support, the Patient Self-Determination Act required proxy can be replaced by monitors. If data show no improvement, an instruction can be sent to the patient's electronic medical record instructing the care team to A-N-D, allow natural death. However, there's a possibility that rationing won't happen as the pre president's men say it should as their law is fragile. The Supreme Court could undo it. 
If that happens, I will go back to my original list. I will give up on rationing as being the most expedient solution and opt for solution number two. What a relief it would be to families and providers to see primary care physicians and palliative teams gently guide care away from futile flailing, repeated hospital admissions, and aggressive interventions. When this happens, we will need fewer physicians and many more chaplains at the bedside. Thank you.